Hello, and welcome to the Groovy Writer Podcast, where we explore how to find your writing groove, regardless of your circumstances. I'm your host, author and MFA instructor, Nicole McGinnis. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the podcast. I have recently been out shoveling the driveway and the front steps and the back steps and a little path to the woodshed. So if I sound a little tuckered out today, that is why we had a little bit of an unexpected, almost spring blizzard blow through. We were just expecting an inch or two or three, but it ended up being quite a bit more. And we have Miss Rosa here visiting us. So all sorts of happenings today. When I'm out doing things like working in the yard or shoveling snow or bringing in wood, I'm often thinking about how incredibly grateful I am for the people who really stand beside me with my writing. They're not all writers, although some of them are, but whether it's friends, family members, the cat, who's very much a vocal supporter, or fellow writers who I'm not necessarily related to, or maybe don't even know that well. There's something about having what I consider to be a pit crew when one is a creative person, whether, uh, you know, a visual artist, a writer, a dancer, a filmmaker, whatever sort of art you do. If you've been at it for long enough, you know that those people who stick by you, not just when things are great, and there are projects to be celebrated and successes to be celebrated. But during the grind, during those times when as a working artist, a working writer, you are, you're sort of down in it. You're just, it's the grind. You're doing the work. You may love it. Hopefully you do love it. But it can be a little more of a slog at some times than it is at others. So today I'm going to depart a little bit from talking strictly about writers finding their own groove. And instead, I'm going to focus on how the people who have writers in their lives can help those writers find and hopefully stay in their writing group. In my experience, some people are extremely talented at this. And again, I'm lucky to have a handful of those people in my life, and I'm very, very grateful for them. So maybe the writer in your life is your child who's just discovering this love of writing. Maybe it's a friend, maybe it's your significant other, your spouse. Maybe it's a writer you don't actually know, but you love their work and you wanna know how you can best support them as a reader. So let's talk about that today. Let's face it, as writers, we can be solitary and really rather elusive creatures. And we're not, I should speak for only myself here, but I think I can speak for some other writers because I have, I've heard this directly from other writers. We're really not always great, some of us, at asking for what we need, whether that need is time to think about our writing, which I consider to be a very legit part of the writing process, or whether it's time to actually write, which is, of course, the biggie, or whether it's a useful space in which to write, those sorts of practical concerns that writers tend to have. And even though we can be, some of us, a little hesitant to share these needs, they can, after all, seem a little bit selfish, a little bit, what's the word I'm looking for? Decadent. There are some general guidelines that those people who have writers in their lives can use to draw us out of our writing caves once in a while to figure out how you can help us. So let's go ahead and start with people who are parents of budding writers. Obviously, if your child is, let's say, in grade school and they're already figuring it out, they love to maybe, as both my kids did, especially one of my kids, love to make picture books at a very young age, first with pictures, then with text. And these would get quite ornate and quite complex. It was really great. So you may have a really young budding writer, in which case I think it's pretty much common sense that you want to encourage that. I mean, the literacy skills alone, the art skills, any kind of practice, I think that kids can get away from 
phones and tablets and video games and tech is fantastic. So if they are actually writing and drawing, obviously for little kids, fine motor skills, it's fantastic. And the thinking and the creativity that goes into that. So obviously that's pretty easy to support. I think in that case, I remember just supplying paper, crayons, pencils, markers when the kids got old enough, just age appropriate materials and just keep that coming. So that's pretty easy. Once they start to get older, let's say middle school and beyond, one of the things that parents might be tempted to do is to sort of carefully critique the writing. There are different schools of thought on this. I, as someone who has taught composition for decades, I of course am a big fan of instilling strong composition skills in young people as much as possible. Those are really, really important as a foundation for written communication. That said, as a creative writer also, and a teacher of creative writing, I have a very strong view about not trying to over guide, not trying to over critique a creative piece of writing. In other words, if your preteen or new teen comes to you and says, hey, I, I wrote the story, will you look at it? If you tend to know what they're capable of, and maybe you're seeing uh, language usage issues, for example, or if they typed it out, you're seeing typos or misspellings or whatever it might be. It's very easy to want to go into correction mode, I think, for some parents and want to point out, oh, look, you did this here. This isn't quite right. And I would just say, if you've done this, don't be too hard on yourself. But I would say when a child comes to you with a creative piece of work, and they're a certain age, again, up to young teens, I would be very, very hesitant to go into critique mode unless they're specifically asking you, hey, I really am, don't know how to use semicolons. Did I do it right here, for example? But otherwise, I would focus on the story, focus on what is compelling about that story, even if you see plenty that you think, oh boy, this kid will never get published if they keep this up. You know, if, if you're seeing stuff where it's not so great, that's okay. It's learning. We all start somewhere. But if you see that spark, I'm here to tell you it is very, very easily extinguished. And you might think, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in a moment with high school aged kids, you might think, oh, that's great. I want to extinguish it. I want my kid to be a doctor or a lawyer or any of those traditionally high dollar careers. But there is a price to be paid, in my very strong opinion, for squashing someone's passion when you are in a situation to do that. So if a kid comes to you and they're interested in something, I'm all for guiding them, but I'm definitely not for trying to discourage them. And writing is, is just a great thing to do. Plenty of doctors and lawyers and financial people and people in all different careers write and do very, very well at it. Writing, I think, is one of those foundational skills that doesn't mean someone is necessarily going to be a poet, but that they will have a great set of foundational written communication skills, which as most people know, is hugely important, regardless of the direction professionally in which that child will grow up to head toward. So obviously, lots of praise, lots of encouragement for kids up to a certain age. I mean, obviously, I think kids and adults up to all ages. But if you are a parent, and you are very nervous at the thought of your child going into a creative career, and that child is an older teen. Maybe they're a high school, sophomore, junior, senior, and they're, they're the artsy kid. They love writing or they love art. Whatever it is, if that makes you nervous, that's understandable for some parents, especially if they themselves maybe had a bad experience trying to have a career in the arts, or if they know someone who, in their opinion, sort of crashed and burned and is now living as a pauper or whatever it might be. It's very easy for parents to get nervous about that. But again, I would tend to encourage, having gotten two creative writing degrees, they were called slightly different. One was an English emphasis and one was a literature emphasis, but basically they're creative writing degrees. Having gotten two of those, I can tell you a huge majority of the people I was close to in college, who, and this was a very artsy college that I went to, it was UC Santa Cruz, and I was in the arts college. So I was surrounded by artists of all stripes. And I can tell you, the majority of those people who I still know have gone on to have fantastic careers, some in the arts and some really not. But that foundation of having a liberal arts education is 
in my opinion, not a bad thing. In fact, it can be really quite a wonderful thing. And I, I would venture to say a very life enriching thing. So if you are a parent of a high schooler and they are giving all the signs that I'm going to become a famous writer and you just think, oh, there's no way they're going to be able to support children or whatever. You're thinking practically like a parent. That's understandable, but I wouldn't worry too much about it. If they figure out that it's really not going to work for them, that's going to be part of their life lesson. And they might also decide that they go in sort of a hybrid direction where they decide, hey, I want a career where I can make a decent income or an excellent income that is also going to allow me to write, to keep in touch with books and literature and reading and writing as much as possible. So maybe then they go on to become a teacher or they go on to become a librarian or an editor or an agent or a ghostwriter, or maybe they go on to do something completely non-writing related. And they also have kept that education in the field of writing alive, which again, that can help, I believe, in virtually any career field. So the possibilities really are endless. And this is getting into sort of the psychological territory that this podcast really isn't completely about. But I think that as a parent, the main thing you're likely to do by trying to discourage a teen writer from following that path is I think you're likely to cause them to possibly keep a very, very important and valued part of themselves from you, sort of hidden. And again, this isn't universal. Some young people will do this and some people won't. But in my experience, that love of the arts, that love of books, that love of writing doesn't just go away because a parent or any other authority figure says, no, 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 this isn't good. Don't do that. It might go underground or they might just not talk to you about it, which I think as a parent is a shame, but really who could blame them? So moving on from young writers, kids, teens, young adults, and especially once they get into college, they're going to have a whole built-in system of support, which is one great thing. You can almost just sort of step away and maybe go into a little happy denial. Let the university folks and their peers and their instructors support them for a while. And then when you see how fabulous they are later on, maybe you can come back around and go, yeah, this, this was a great choice. That is a best case scenario. So moving on though, from the younger writers, if you're a friend of a writer, in general, and I'm just gonna, from this point forward, sort of assume we're talking about adult writers. Even if you are not a writer yourself, if you're just a supportive friend, a bit of a cheerleader, you wanna be there for them, and you can see that they struggle with whatever it might be, finding time to write, or they struggle with having the confidence to put their writing out there, there's just a whole range of things that writers struggle with. So if you are a friend, I think one of the biggest things you can do is offer to read their stuff. Seriously, you might not know this. And especially not being a writer, you might think, well, what sort of value could I really add to this for them? Because I, you know, I like to read, but I'm not really literary. It's not really my thing. I didn't do so great in English. Here's the thing, beta readers, and that's what we tend to call people who read a draft of a manuscript and provide feedback and critique or just their thoughts on it. These folks are worth their weight in gold to writers. So even if you're not a writer, even if you wonder what value you could bring to the table as a reader, please be aware that just being another set of eyes on a piece of writing, I call it a fresh set of eyes on a work in progress, you are incredibly valuable. You bring objectivity, you can give your feedback, you can give your reactions you can ask questions, and these things can really, really help a writer. One caveat here is that I do recommend letting your writer friend know your limitations as far as time, because if you turn out to be a good beta reader, which you probably will if you care about the writer, your services will likely be in high demand. So I do recommend saying, hey, I've got these other commitments and I only have a certain amount of time, but yes, I would be happy to read your work. And just by doing that, or just by asking a friend, hey, what are you working on? Can I read some of it or all of it when you're done? You might not know what a huge boost that can be for a writer who is in the trenches and maybe having a lot of self-doubt 
having a lot of doubt about the project and whether or not it'll work, whether or not it'll be any good, whether or not it'll sell, etc., etc. Like I said, there is just a bundle of stuff that writers tend to fret about. So if you could be that person who checks in with them and who offers to read and to give honest feedback. I think a lot of friends feel this sense of, well, they're my friend, so I just want to say it's really good and you're great and keep going. And that's lovely. But what's really great is when you can dive a little deeper and ask questions. So I noticed that the characters seem to switch from this sort of attitude to a, a totally different attitude that didn't really ring as true to me in the next chapter. Why Was that intentional? Why was that? Just talk about the story. It doesn't mean you have to be harsh. It doesn't mean you have to be critical in the negative sense, but let the writer know that I'm actually, yeah, I'm, I'm seeing what you're trying to do here and I have some questions. To me, that's an ideal kind of beta reader. I can't, of course, speak for other writers, but beta readers in general, ugh, for any of you who already do this, you are awesome and your writer is very, very lucky to have you. So let's say you don't necessarily have a writer in your life, but you are a fan of a particular writer. Maybe that person is very well known, or maybe they're just starting out. Maybe they're a debut writer. I remember that debut year and the people in my life who talked up my books and wrote reviews and had helped me read the manuscript and would go into bookstores and say, do you have this book by Nicole McGinnis? And it was really sweet. And sometimes I think, oh, don't do that, you know, but it's okay. There's nothing wrong with doing that. They wanted to support me that way. So those were the people I knew who were doing those things that people who are friends and family of writers do. But it was the people I didn't know who supported the book that really sort of blew me away. These were librarians. These were readers who had received what are called ARCs, which are advanced reader copies of books that are going to come out in the coming months. And that they generally become available before the book is actually for sale. So that reviewers, everything from the big trade reviewers to bloggers, etc., can get an ARC and they can read it and they can put out sort of a pre-review. And some of these people, I had never met them, and they would write reviews, and they would contact me, and they would say, hey, I have this blog, and I'd love to interview you. That meant more to me than almost anything, because they weren't my friends and family, and I, I love the friends and family, but these were strangers who connected with the book and then wanted to support me. So those people are out there as well. And it's not just for writers who are traditionally published. There are all sorts of online support networks for writers. So even if you don't have as a writer, someone in your life to support you directly who you know, and can see face to face, you can find these people online. And if you are those people online, and by the way, I am focusing on the people online who are supporting writers in a positive way. I don't mean no one can write a negative review. Sometimes people don't like books and that's fine. But I'm specifically focusing here on those readers and librarians and bloggers who their goal is to make the books that they love more visible by giving shout outs, by creating reviews, by doing interviews with the authors. You all are fabulous and wonderful. And yeah, so if you are one of those people, great. And if you're not necessarily a book blogger or someone who has a literature related website, but you are on social media, you can support your favorite authors that way. Obviously buying their books is great. Checking their books out of the library is also great. Sometimes people think, well, I'm just not really helping them that way. I'm getting it for free. But librarians and libraries are huge for any author, any traditionally published author. And Rosa concurs. So even checking out a book from a library, doing a quick shout out on whatever social media platform or platforms you're on, that is a wonderful, wonderful way to support writers. It really can go a long way toward giving a writer a confidence boost, especially if a writer's having a not so great day. The cat is walking all over my paperwork here. Are you done? <coughs> Apparently not. Did I mention she's a Siamese? Let's move on to... Those of you who are a spouse or significant other of a writer, I don't know whether to say congratulations or I'm sorry, maybe it's both. We can get back to the beginning of this episode when I was talking about writers being a bit uh, reclusive and sometimes a little hesitant to express their needs. And I, I think this can 
be a bit frustrating sometimes for those who are very close with writers. So here's a biggie. And I think spouses and significant others are in an especially solid place to help make this happen. At the beginning of this episode, I talked about how some of the big things that writers really need, but that I think can often feel especially selfish to ask for, or especially decadent, time. If you and your writer spouse, let's say, are parents to small children, let's say, time is so precious. And it could be that your writer spouse has just decided, you know what, until these little ones are grown, I, I have to just put the writing on the back burner. What I would say to you, if it's at all possible, if you can, even if it's maybe once a week, honey, I'm going to take the kids, we're going to go to the park for a few hours, here's some coffee, you have the house, and I want you to write. That is the kind of gift that I just think becomes more precious as the years go by and a writer looks back on that and realizes that was a real sacrifice. That was huge. And it may not seem like a big deal to you to say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to give my spouse this time to write. I'm going to make sure the office is cleaned up, the office space, the writing desk, the kitchen table, wherever it is they do their writing. And I'm just going to take the kids for a few hours. That might not seem like a big deal to you, but to someone who is in the trenches, not just with their writing, but with a big responsibility, like little kids, that is huge. And I think it is very, very much appreciated. And I think one of the reasons it's appreciated is because it's a way of saying to that very important person in your life, I see you. I know that you love this. This is a very important part of your life. And I want to make sure that I'm doing what I can. And it may not be as much as I want to be able to do it. But at least for this amount of time, let's say every week, I want to be able to provide you with the opportunity to stay in touch with this thing that you love, the writing. If you have a little more flexibility, maybe a little more money and maybe a little more time, perhaps kids aren't an issue, for example, a really lovely thing to do for a spouse or a significant other who is a writer is to, this sounds a little counterintuitive, but to send them away, even a weekend at a relatively inexpensive little you know, Airbnb, a vacation rental would likely be hugely appreciated by any writer who is struggling with distraction, whatever that distraction might be. Often the distraction is just being at home because for many of us, any excuse to stop writing and do something else, oh, dishes need to be done. Oh, I need to uh, go fix my hair. Oh, need to brush my teeth. Oh, the floor needs to be mopped. Just being at home can often provide so many handy distractions from the writing and such easy an easy way to avoid the writing that if you can send your dearest off to a room somewhere for the weekend, that can be huge. It can really be a great way to kickstart a project that has stalled out or to really dive into a project they're just starting or to edit a project that they've just completed. I know when I, late in 2020, finished finally a manuscript that I had been working on for quite a while, and it came to the final editing phase, I needed to just sort of lock myself away for about three days and just focus on nothing else. I was able to do that fairly easily. I don't have little kids. I don't have a lot of distractions at home. But if I did have a lot going on, I would have benefited greatly from just a room. And sometimes your writer significant other might say, honey, I want you to come with me. And if you think writing would get done in that case, great, you can make it a retreat for both of you. But I do think often it's really nice to just carve out not just time, but a dedicated space. And on a more day to day basis, something you can really do at home for your writer is make sure there is a dedicated space that is not being intruded upon by you, by kids, by anyone else, as much as possible. And I have lived in some very, very tiny homes. My home now isn't huge either, but I don't have little kids running around anymore. But even if you have a small home already, if you can set up a little writing desk in a corner, and that is just sort of a sacred place where mommy or daddy goes to write and the rest of us really respect that space, I think that is huge. 
And I've known many writers who do that very well. It doesn't have to be a whole fancy office. Many people don't have an extra room that they can do that with just to dedicate to the writing. But if you can help to create and maintain and respect that space, that is a wonderful thing. I want to wrap up this conversation with a quote. This will be today's Daily Groove. The quote comes to us from Henri Matisse, a wonderful painter who very famously and simply said, creativity takes courage. Honestly, part of me feels like everything I've described in the past half hour has pretty much made writers seem a little bit neurotic and like we're these gigantic hothouse flowers, which, okay, many of us are both of those things, or at least one of those things. But I do think that at our hearts, most writers are simply creative people who have the desire to bring the stories that are in our heads to life. Whatever the case though, whatever our motivation for writing might be, the simple fact is creativity does indeed require courage. And I think that is more true today in our modern, super fast-paced, light-speed world than it has ever been. But I will say this, It is much easier to find that courage when we have people in our lives who can help us find it. So for those of you who are listening, who are those people to writers, I just want to say on behalf of all of us, thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Groovy Writer Podcast. You can connect with the podcast on my website at nicolemcinnis.com and on Instagram at The Groovy Writer. The intro and outro music is Retro by Wayne Jones. Until next time, write on, Groovy Writers. Write on. <laughs>